Anti-Capitalist Caucus of Occupy Fort Lauderdale, generously hosted by the Unitarian Universalist Church of Fort Lauderdale. My name is Mark Lizetti. For those who don't know me, I think it really almost everybody does. What's uh, Rosetti? Luzetti. Luzetti. Yes. I'm picking notes for the opposition. Okay. <laughs> well, the opposition knows all this. So. <laughs> they have you. They have everything tapped on the <laughs> Um. So. I've been a communist now for about 20 some odd years. My analysis comes, the analysis I'm going to present tonight comes out of that experience, about actually a particular trend within communism called Trotskyism. And the reason is he was one of the very first people to analyze fascism when it appeared on the scene. Um, and I personally think his, his analysis has stood up over the years. Um, it will also be based on the work of a French anarchist named Daniel Garin. And if anybody's interested in some of the, the books that they've written, you know, I'll give those later. Uh, so first, why don't we start out with uh, what others think fascism is? So if anybody wants to raise their hand, and if not, I'll just start randomly picking on people. Tea partiers. <laughs> Tea partiers. Anyone else? <laughs> what do you think fascism is? Conflagration of um, corporate and government uh, power. Okay, now that's a, that's a very common definition. It doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> There's a way you said it. <laughs> Interesting answer. <laughs> Maybe you think I stepped into something. <laughs> No. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, anyone else? Strong nationalism is associated. Oh yeah. Strong nationalism. Jeff. Generally, <laughs> just a piece of it is generally repression against specific groups. Okay. Scapegoats. Repression of scapegoats. Okay, just scapegoating. sense of their own group. They were sexist, they were warlike. Um, so that this list that's actually quite popular actually tells us nothing about fascism. It simply tells us that fascism is like every other government that ever did. And if that's the case, then fascism isn't anything new. It's not anything especially dangerous. It's not anything that we should be concerned about. And I think the experience with at least the two governments that we know of for sure, for certain, that were fascism is these were something that was 
especially dangerous, especially brutal, that the world has never really seen before and hasn't seen since. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not a continuing danger. Now, the most popular definition is the one that Jay gave us, which is corporations plus government. And supposedly this is attributed to Mussolini. Mussolini is the guy who founded fascism, so he ought to know, right? I mean, if anybody's going to know what fascism is, it's the guy who starts the movement. Um, except there's really no evidence that he actually ever said it. So we can't really take that definition. But if he did, here's the other thing, is the fascists had a different idea of what, when they were talking about corporations, they were talking about something very different. Um, when you say to an American, when you say to someone um, in most of Western Europe, a corporation, the first thing that comes to mind is a joint stock corporation. But in Latin and in the medieval times, there was a different meaning for corporation. A corporation it comes from the word, from the Latin root corpus, so the body. Um, and a corporation was any part of society. So the church was a corporation in medieval life. The guilds were corporations in medieval life. The peasants were part of, were a corporation. So all these different parts of society were corporations. And so in fascist ideology. To say that fascism is the fusion of corporations with the government is to say that it is the fusion of everything with the state. Um, and we have, there are more modern um, types of governments that are similar to this, and there's actually a, a political trend uh, that a political scientist called corporatism, which is, and it's very popular, and it was very popular in Latin America after the Second World War, and in many um, Latin government like Portugal, Spain, uh, where they would try and basically order all of society. It's like everything has its place. And fascism is an ex in a certain sense, is the ideology was a very extreme part of that. Now, there are a lot of different ways. We'll take questions at the end. So okay. I'll still write it down. Is that you yeah. forget it? Um, there are a lot of different ways to analyze fascism. It, it's quite fascinating, the same way serial killers are fascinating. Um, you know, we can look at the way they thought. We can look at um, the way they dress. We can look at, I mean, you know, the things that they really, you know, that uh, uh, some of the external trappings of fascism or what they thought about themselves, what they wrote down, but that really doesn't tell us a lot about them. I mean, if you ask somebody about themselves, you know, they can tell you certain things about them, but that doesn't really tell you the truth about them. In fact, most people have a, you know, their vision of themselves and what the rest of the world thinks about them are very different things. <coughs> and this is true of fascism as well. And so to understand fascism, we really need to look at where fascism came from, the groups that it came from, um, how it functioned in society, and the groups that it served. <coughs> so, to start out with, I'm going to give you a very brief, very brief, bit of Marxism to kind of explain the you know where fascism comes out of. And so, Marxism has a class analysis of society, um, and the class analysis is. And it's, a, it's a, actually a fairly common one. It's an old one. And that's, you know, you can, group, you can group anything into classes. And classes don't necessarily have to mean anything. You know, we, could, we could group, you know, this room into the class of people with dark hair and the class of people with, you know, receding hairlines and so on. Um, and those are classes that don't really mean anything, but you could divide people up that way. And so when you're trying to have class analysis of society, you're trying to find ways of grouping people that have meaning. Previous to Marx, the idea was is that how you would group people in society to understand how society really functioned was you would figure out, you know, what did they do? What was their role in society? And Marx took this himself. And uh, so there would be a class of people who owned all the land. And there would be a class of people who had to work the land. And that class of people would be the peasants and the people who owned the land would be the landlords. In a capitalist society, you have a group of people who they have to work. 
they have nothing else that they can offer society except their ability to work. And they have to work for people who own all the money and all the machines. And so <coughs> that class is the capitalist. In between those two layers, <coughs> there is another group of people who don't easily fit into either one. You know, like small shopkeepers, <coughs> professionals, doctors, teachers, <coughs> etc. You know, people who work for the state. And this grouping is called the middle class. But the middle class is a very unstable position. People are always rising into it or falling out of it. Um, it's not an easy position to be in. You're constantly in, a, you know, constantly in fear of losing what you have. Um, middle class tends to be kind of conservative politically <coughs> because they don't want, you know, they want law and order. They want people to, you know, not to steal their stuff. They want, you know, to not have to be around poor people. Um, they want things nice and all. They want them taken care of. But in capitalism, capitalism is a rather unstable <coughs> type of society. It's always um, inventing new ways of doing things. And so just when the middle class, th when some member of the middle class thinks they've got some kind of stability, stability, capitalism will come along and say, we've got a brand new way to do this. We can do it for everybody for cheaper. And those people lose their position in society. So for example, for a long time, being a teacher was a rather prestigious position in our society. But capitalism has come along and said, you know, we can have for-profit schools that are even less expensive than, than um, regular schools. And the teacher's position has become precarious, and it's much harder for them to earn a living. Or bank tellers, as they were able to automate more and more of the banker's job, it has gone from being a middle-class profession to being a wage, a, you know, a salary, you know, a, a low-wage position. As this happens, hey, I thought you four wrong rooms. Lulu was laughing. She said the littlest revolutionary. I walked into their room. <laughs> He's paying attention. Now he's awake. Come. So, during periods of economic crisis. Um, the working class usually gets hit the hardest, uh, you know, because if there's nothing to sell, then the, the factories close down, they lay off workers, the workers can't buy anything, things go to work. The middle class also takes it pretty hard because, you know, who buys stuff from their shops? Workers without money. And when this happens, they start saying, you know, they start getting mad, getting angry, um, but there's really not a lot they can do about it. But if the working class is organized, if they have their own political movement, if they have strong and powerful unions, they're actually in a position to prevent the ruling class from putting all of the burden of the economic crisis on them. And when that happens, the middle class takes it especially hard. And when that happens, because they're so afraid of losing everything, of being wiped out, of, of having to become a worker or becoming homeless, they start looking around for who is responsible for my situation. You know, why is this happening? Why is society getting out of control? And they start looking for scapegoats. The scapegoating is a very real part of this. You know, and in Italy, they blame the gypsies. They blame the workers because the workers had occupied the factories. And they said, we're not taking the brunt of this crisis. And in Germany, the unions and the communists said, we're not taking the brunt of this crisis. You know, we refuse. You know, we'll go on strike, and <clears throat> you know, we're not the ones that are going to pay. We didn't cause this. And so you have the beginnings of this movement starting to happen. Like, we need to make the workers pay. We need to make the Jews pay because they're the ones who stab Germany in the back. We need to make the Gypsies pay because they're always running around stealing stuff, and and we need to make immigrants pay because they're willing to do our work for less. And we see that today. But they also recognize that the capitalists have a role in this. They say, the bankers. And when you look at every fascist movement, they blame the bankers. <coughs> They're not wrong in that particular case. <laughs> 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 you know? they got <laughs> I mean, if they were completely, if they were completely out of touch with reality, they wouldn't grow. 
And when we look at the early fascist movements, they have this anti-capitalist, but also anti-socialist viewpoint. The problem is the communists and the capitalists. We have to smash both in order to restabilize society. Everybody has to be made to work together for the betterment of society. And that's where that corporatism kind of idea comes in. But the middle class is also a rather small section of society. Now, in America, we think of the middle class as being almost everybody. In actuality, <laughs> most people are not part of the middle class, but because the working class was unionized and powerful for so long, they were able to extract a middle class standard of living. <clears throat> um, but there are also segments of society that aren't protected by the capitalists, aren't, I mean, aren't protected by the communists and the socialists and the powerful labor unions. There are other sectors, the working class, that, you know, they weren't strong enough to stand up and they would lose their jobs. And of course, you also have people who just generally have a reactionary or, or backwards kind of political mentality. So people who vote against their own interests. Um, and we see that here. You know, there's a lot of people. For example, you know, it's, it's very popular to talk about people who vote for the Republicans voting against their own interests. Some argue people who vote for Democrats also vote against their own interests. But at least they pretend to care for labor. Whereas, you know, the GOP blames labor. I'm like, yeah, and who do you vote for? Um, and we see that even in Germany. We saw that in the you know, workers who blame other workers. It's like, oh, it's you union guys screwing everything up. And so that, you know, and once this movement begins, a lot of the backwards working class begins, and elements of the working class, and criminals, and people who've never had jobs, begin to follow this movement. And so while it comes out of the middle class, it also attracts other layers. And that happens with any really powerful, popular movement. Mm -hmm. So for example, you've always seen, when the communists got large, that there were even elements from the ruling class that joined them. You know, and that's directly against their material interests, but it was a, a movement that attracted people. And fascism has this vision of a, of a future. I mean, at the one hand, they look backwards to this glorious golden age, the glories of Rome, the glories of ancient Germany. But they also say, but, you know, we have this glorious future ahead of us where we're all going to work together for the good of the nation. You know, and we're going to have all of this modern stuff. We're going to have these great buildings and cities and highways and... So there's this really reactionary element, there's this really futurist looking element at the same time. But they can only go so far. The state is still powerful. It still has an army, it still has a police. And when they first start out, they're not able to do much. But as the crisis continues, as the capitalists aren't able to resolve their issues, um, because the working class still and hold up, you know, can say, look, we're not paying for this. The capitalists look around like, all right, who can we turn to who can smash this working class so that we can start making a profit again? And there exists in society this mass movement. And they say, all right, Hitler, Mussolini, here's some money. Go break that union. And these guys who had been complaining about the capitalists, <coughs> are perfectly willing to take their money. And Daniel Garin, in his book, he lays out how <clears throat> a thousand cars were handed over to the Nazis. And Hermann Goring says, you cannot imagine what this meant to us. Hitler was flown around Germany on a plane that was owned by one of the bosses. And so this gives this small group a seemingly much larger representation of society. So they can be anywhere at any time. They look much bigger. So, the very power, now it's only a certain segment of the ruling class that actually funds these guys because most of the rest of them look at them and there's like, you know, these guys are, they're plebeian, they're lower class, they're thugs, they have improper manners. <laughs> um, even if they're middle class, I mean, when you're, when you're in the highest levels of the bourgeoisie, even middle class people are beneath you. And they really don't like associating with these people. Um, and of course there's the rhetoric, <coughs> first the communists, then the capitalists, we're going to smash them too. And so there's a kind of a bit of a trust issue. But as they give money, the fascists come around, 
and even though they still continue this anti-capitalist rhetoric, none of their violence is directed at the capitalist class. It's always directed at workers, or it's directed at the other scapegoats of society. And so you see more and more that fascists would go in and start <coughs> breaking strikes, and they'd attack union leaders, and they'd kill people. Um, and one of the ways they got away with it was they would wear a uniform, so they all look exactly the same. So you could never say, oh, it's that guy who got me. Ultimately, as the crisis continues to not be resolved, the capitalists are forced to turn the state over to these guys. And this is a very dangerous move for them because they are an alien class. And you can't really be sure what they're going to do with power. So try and so they try to win them over. They start bringing them in. So like you know, they start associating. Um, Mussolini was not elected. Mussolini he gathered his men. He marched on Rome. And the king of Italy said, "All right, Mussolini is the prime minister now." And in Germany, the Nazis got 44 percent of the vote. Uh, and they did an analysis. I mean, that was, that was enough to give them control of the Reichstag. And then they could demand that um, the president of Germany, uh, Hindenburg, made uh, Hitler the premier, prime minister. But they did an analysis. They said, all right, half of our votes are protests. If we don't move now, we're never going to have this moment again. And so unfortunately burned the right stack for them. As they were able to pass a number of laws that outlawed the socialists and outlawed the communists. And they turned around, they immediately, I mean, with the, now with their mass movement, and they had millions of people in this movement, millions. They had two million people in the stormtroopers alone. They were able to turn around, they outlawed the unions, and created new fascist unions, which basically <coughs> Um, were a way of regimenting the workers within the factories. They smashed all opposition to capitalism, and in Germany, profitability was restored right away. And so during the 1930s, the crisis of the 1930s, when every other major capitalist government is having trouble, Germany's growing, the economy is growing. <clears throat> in Italy, the fascists never had that much power. So they were always kind of struggling. Um, and they were never able, and although they did repress the unions, they did repress the communists, and they repressed the socialists, they weren't able to wipe them out. They took their best leaders, they put them in jail forever, um, but they were not anywhere near as ruthless as the Nazis, who pretty much exterminated that whole group. Um, and you can see what happened, the results is after both governments were defeated in West Germany, the communists were eradicated as a force, they never came back. Um, they were never able to actually do anything in Italy. In 1947, they almost won the elections. So what can we draw from these two experiences to really to kind of understand what the fascist movement is? So, so for the first part, we understand is they come out of the middle class. The, ru the middle class is facing ruination. It's uh, enraged and afraid for its, its, uh, its life. The second thing is, is that we need a very powerful working class, which in a moment of economic crisis, the capitalists are not able to force them to take cuts. We need a capitalist class that is, that is willing to fund the movement. And that's kind of the difference between what happens in Spain and what happened in Italy and, and Germany is the fascists in Spain never got ruling class support. Even though our movement called Franco and his people fascists, that was a rhetorical thing. Like, we have to fight the fascists, and that was a way to motivate people to fight against Franco. But Franco actually used the fascists and never was a fascist himself. So, this movement needs the actual support of the, of the capitalist class. And we had a severe economic crisis where the 
capitalist class knows that it's facing an existential threat, or at least certain parts of it. And when you have those three elements together, <clears throat> is when you see the rise, the, the rise of powerful fascist movements. They don't always take control. Sometimes they're just enough to scare people. Now, if we look at the United States today, some of these factors are present. We have a prolonged economic crisis. We have an enraged middle class, people who are very angry about what they see happening to them. Um, I mean, we see it all the time around us. And, then, and who do they blame? They blame immigrants. They blame black people. They blame the unions. They blame the bankers. They're right about that one. <laughs> They blame Obama. Um, yeah, I don't know about that one. <laughs> partly right about that one because he's with, with the bankers. We also see the support of a section of the capitalist class. You know, when we look at the Tea Party, where you know at first they were just kind of this little fringe group, and all of a sudden money starts pouring into their movement. And where was it coming from? Well, it was coming from people like Dick Armey. He had a lobby group in Washington, and the, insurance, and the insurance companies were giving them all kinds of money, and he was funneling it to the Tea Party. And you've got the Koch brothers, investment bankers, and they're giving all kinds of money. But what they weren't facing was a strong working class, and they weren't facing an existential threat. So can we really think of this as a fascist movement? Well, if we look at where the money was coming from, it was coming from the insurance company, you know, people who were mostly involved in insurance, and what was happening at the time that the Tea Party exploded. What threat was the insurance industry facing at that time? Universal health care. So this, and, you know, this sector of society, one out of every $6 in the U.S. economy goes through this sector, goes into health care. So this was a very big threat to them. And so they begin pouring money, mass amounts of money into this movement. And we saw the results. You know, they had all kinds of media coverage. They were able to project their forces everywhere. Even, you know, um, being armed around the President of the United States, which I know if I tried it, you probably would be reading my obituary. <coughs> um, <coughs> but we still don't have this. And so, even though this was necessary in the past, it's possible it's not actually something that is needed. Um, so they unleashed this fascist movement on the United States to smash this threat to their section of the capitalist class. And then once that's taken care of, once the, the public option is gone, once any threat of a single payer system is gone, they yank the rug out from underneath funding stops and they kind of tank. The only reason that they had a kind of a last hurrah is because the Democrats themselves had so pissed off their base that nobody went to vote, except the Tea Party. So what does that mean for the future? Don't know yet. This is a very <laughs> ideological, very angry, very passionate group of people who are armed. Um, it takes different forms, so there's, uh, in the military, they have, it, it expresses itself differently. It's the, uh, I forget, they have the Oath Keepers, so they won't take um, uh, orders from the president to act against the American people, which on the one hand, I like, but on the other hand, um, I wonder what else they're willing to do. You know, which, you know, who do they consider the American people? Um, and they have ties to the far right, this the old keepers. Um, when the election comes, they honestly believe they're going to win in November. <coughs> they think that nothing short of electoral fraud, a stolen election, will stop them. And I think it's clear to most people that the Republicans are going to get destroyed in November. Um, I, it's almost like they're trying to throw it, you know, with some of the stuff that they're saying. Uh, so what happens with this enraged armed mass of people? 
don't know. Um, and I think this would be a good point to start the discussion. <laughs> and take it. <laughs> discussion is good. Good stuff comes out in discussion that you know I might have forgotten, or that other people have. Uh, I don't perspectives. think it's so obvious that the Republicans are thrown. The polls don't show that they're in dead heat in a lot of contests. Congressional and presidential. Uh, it depends on the economy. I think three to four months before the general election, if the economy is weaker, and we'll probably have a sweep of the Republicans. If it stays the same as it is now, or gets better. Yeah, I wanted to throw something into that because uh, there's currently a lot of voter suppression laws that were uh, uh, brought on by the Alec. Uh, 